regard to principles of stewardship that we, by which we should be governed. First Chronicles chapter 29, the Old Testament book of First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29, beginning at verse 10. The Old Testament book of First Chronicles at chapter 29, beginning at verse 10. If you have that passage of scripture, say amen. amen. If you don't say, wait for me, I shall wait for you in First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles is close to the beginning of your Bible. It's just before Second Chronicles in the Old Testament. First Chronicles chapter 29, and we'll begin at verse 10. Verse 10, and I'm going to read from verse 10 to verse 14. And this is what the Lord says to us from his word through David's prayer from the New International Version. Listen to the word of God. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying... Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. That's enough. Amen. Praise God for his holy word. Shout hallelujah. Uh, yeah. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to talk for these few moments that we spend together this afternoon from the subject, joyful giving. Joyful giving. Anybody in here receive any Christmas presents over the last weeks or so? You got a Christmas present or two or three? Did you like it? Did you like it? I did. Anybody? Yeah, you, okay. About six people raised their hand. Um, anybody give Christmas presents this past year? Okay. I see you got, you gave more than you got, huh? It seemed like... Uh, more people got, got, got a few things less than they expected or you just didn't like it so you re-gifted it and um, as a consequence you didn't want to raise your hand but all of us every now and then receive gifts from someone and it's our responsibility likewise to, sh to, to share gifts with others as well and sometimes we do it for one or more reasons for some we gave gifts over the Christmas season out of tradition, that's what we do at Christmas time. We're supposed to give gifts. Or some gave it because of expectation. Somebody expected you to give a gift, and so you gave that gift to them because it was the expectation that you would give them something. Or for many of us, it was because of love, because you have a love for that person uh, with whom you exchanged gifts, you, you gave a gift. For some, it was a combination of two or more of those reasons, even reasons beyond what I mentioned to you. But all of us have known sometimes in our lives where we have received gifts and also sometimes in our lives where we have given gifts. I hope that everybody in church today has at least given somebody something at some point in your journey because it is necessary for us to be people who are conduits of blessings. People who understand that blessings don't come to us just to stop at us, but blessings are not only come to us, but move through us to somebody else. If we're supposed to be people who are consistently being a blessing because we have so, been so richly and bountifully blessed. I'm looking in this church this afternoon at some blessed individuals. There's some people in this church who can testify that the blessings of the Lord still astound you. That the blessings of the Lord still amaze you. You are still... You're still in awe that God hooks you up the way God does, that God has been so good to you throughout your life.
lives and as a consequence you have learned to be a blessing to someone else that's really the story of first chronicles chapter 29 these verses i've read in your hearing today the story is really that these brothers and sisters have a love affair with the one to whom they give these gifts and because they love the one to whom they give these gifts they have absolutely no problem joyfully giving their gifts unto god it is the story of the children of Israel. The children of Israel led by King David. King David gives them leadership into what is called a building campaign. Maybe they should have called it building for the future because these brothers and sisters were preparing to build a building for the glory of God. They had in their view the opportunity to build something that would allow the presence of God to be manifested in their midst. You must understand that whenever the saints built a temple, a structure in which the Lord was to reside, it was their intent to build a building in which they could always feel the presence of the Lord, experience the presence of the Lord. Whenever they built a building, that building was built because they believed that God would reside in that temple. As a matter of fact, when that temple is dedicated in Second Chronicles, Old Solomon says, Lord, every time your people pray in this place, I want them to be able to know that you hear their prayer. I want them to know that your eyes are on this place day and night. I want them to know that they never have to worry or wonder as to whether or not you hear them when they pray. But your presence will be in that place to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. That's what old David says to us when he begins to lead the these people in the building of this building. God's presence is going to be there and if you checked out your Bible you should know by now that in God's presence there is fullness of joy. Come on and help me preach. Somebody in here knows that whenever you're in the presence of God, you can't help but have joy down on the inside because the joy that God gives just by being in his presence is very different from any other experience you will ever have. Just knowing that he walks with you and he talks with you and to know that he tells you that you are his own. Here's the next line. The joy that you share as we tarry there, none other has ever known the Bible helps us to understand that these people of God are ready to give their gifts unto the Lord because they want to build this building in which God would reside and they would experience his presence in which there is fullness of joy these brothers and sisters have joy when it comes to giving their gifts to God what in the world is that about how in the world do they have such joy. I submit this afternoon, brothers and sisters, that every believer's life ought be marked with joy. Rewind, press play. Let me give it to you again. I want this to guide you through 2020. Every believer's life ought be marked with joy. I need you to understand that if you're going to represent the God that you say you know and love, you can't be down in the dumps all the time. You can't be aggravated and agitated all the time. The believer's life ought be marked with joy. That means that every season of your life God gives you joy unspeakable and full of glory help me understand that pastor it literally suggests child of God that things do not have to be going your way for you to have joy it suggests that you don't have to have everything going the way you planned it for you to have joy because joy is not dependent on external circumstances joy is an internal reality Woo. I wish I had 10 people in church today who can testify I've got an internal joy that allows me to celebrate Jesus every day of my life. Come on, you already know where I'm going. The old saint said, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Please do not allow your boss and your co-workers to steal your joy. Please do not allow your family members, your children to steal your joy. 
please don't go to the family reunion and be mad all day long because they stole your joy. Don't allow a doctor's report to steal your joy. If God gave it to you, can't nobody just steal it from you. It's the joy that you have down on the inside. Change your language. Don't let anybody steal your joy. It's yours, my brothers and sisters. And these friends of the Israelite community understood what it meant to have a joyful spirit. They had joy even as they gave their gifts unto the Lord. Can we walk through the scriptures for a little while? Because it seems to me that these brothers and sisters can teach us some things. As we watch the movements of the text unfold, they can teach us some things about joyful giving. I submit, friends, that that joyful giving begins with an understanding of origination. Mm. Joyful giving begins with an understanding of origination. Somebody say origination. Literally knowing from whence your blessings have come. Now, when you know from where you received all that you have received, it makes you act differently about that which you received. Now, friends, when you were reading with me this afternoon, you should have heard me when I got to verse 14 because it says everything has come from you and we give back to you what you first placed into our hand. Let me read it from the New International Version. Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. The King James Version is so wonderful that the saints made a song about it many years ago and after the offering in many churches back in the day they used to sing a song that went like this all things come of thee O Lord and of thine own have we given thee this my brothers and sisters is the picture of brothers and sisters men and women who understand that the only way they got what they got is because God was gracious enough and generous enough to give it to them in the first place oh don't you miss this. I said we're talking about some blessed people in 1 Chronicles 29 and some blessed people at 3826. And you all can testify that every blessing you have received has come from a God who granted you favor even when you always didn't deserve it. Is there anybody in here who can thank God for all of the blessings that he has lavished in your life? Oh, my brothers and sisters, all of us today can thank God that every day of our lives, as the Bible says, he loads us with benefits, that he hooks us up every single day of our lives and proves to us that he is for us even if everybody else is against us. I need 10 people in here who can testify. You know good and well you don't deserve all the blessings that God has given to you, but every time you wake up in the morning, you wake up to brand new mercies and all day long you're walking around with fresh grace. Somebody in here ought to thank God that he keeps on on doing great things for you every time you turn around he keeps making a way multiple times in chapter 29 David says everything we have has come from you he says everything in heaven and in earth has come from you he said wealth and honor have come from you now you got to catch this because David is no slouch of an individual David is a wealthy brother by the time he writes this text he's on his way to his grave but he's praising God all the way to his grave because he knows that God has continually blessed his life you must not know David's story let me give you a piece of it he was a shepherd boy sitting out in the field tending the sheep of his father but the Bible says that while he was out there tending his father's sheep here comes Samuel an oil, a flask of oil and he begins to anoint him and says that although you in the sheep field now you're destined for the king's palace Woo. Is there anybody in this building today who can thank God that where you begin has nothing to do with where you will end? If God is with you, he can take you from where you started to where he wants you to go. And he rises from the sheepfold to be the sweet psalmist of Israel to eventually becoming the king over all of Israel. Is there a witness in the place who can testify he'll take you out the hood and put you in a corner office and make you the CEO of the office? He'll give you a title you don't deserve so that everybody can know if God be for us who can be against us 
It is, it is, it is an understanding of origination. You want to know why so many people around you are as joyful as they are this afternoon? It's not that they're trying to get on your nerves with all their hollering and jumping up and sitting down. They're not trying to get on your nerves. They just keep having flashbacks of all the great things God has done and how God kept blessing them in spite of them and hooking them up in ways they didn't anticipate. Somebody ought to know that every good and perfect gift has come from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. said that God has blessed these brothers and sisters. He keeps on showering them with good things. He keeps on loading them up with good things. And somebody in church today ought to thank God that you know where your blessings come from. Don't you fool me this afternoon. Is there anybody in here who is not confused? It is not because you look so good, even though you do. It is not because you got the right mentality and mindset, even though you're smart as you can be. It is not because you came from the right family. Praise God for your pedigree. Somebody can thank God that when I look up in the sky, I can give God glory because he keeps on blessing me. Hallelujah. It is an understanding of origination. And it, it, that, that God jumped this thing off. God got this started. And he that has begun a good work in you. He's going to keep it going. He's going to carry it on until the day of Jesus. I wish I had 10 people in here who can still believe with me that God has, is not through blessing you. I said, God is not through blessing. If he did it before, he can do it again. I said, God is not through blessing you. Don't you dare come up in church with your head hung down. God is not finished blessing you. His business of stewardship begins with an understanding of origination. It is Psalm 24 that says the earth is the Lord's. Y'all already know the Bible. I love this church. And the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, that God begins with, that it all begins with God, that God blesses us even when we don't ask for it. Woo. Even when we don't deserve it. Even when we haven't been good enough to merit it. He just keeps on doing great things for us. It's again, it's an issue of origin, origination, but may I push it just a bit farther? And if you watch the movements of the text, it's not just an understanding of origination. But you'll find out, my brothers and sisters, that when you look at the brothers and sisters of the Israelite community, they have become for us what we need to see as a united congregation. They are a united congregation. Somebody say united. Somebody say congregation. And these brothers and sisters have come from disparate places, but they've come together as the people of God. They come from varying walks of life. But when they get to the place of meeting, they are united to do what is necessary to build up the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, I dare say they come from varying socioeconomic realities. But those realities don't stop them from uniting when they get together for the common good. That, that no one is left out. They're a congregation. No one is just looking to everybody else to do it, but they all unite together to make it happen. That word united is a beautiful word. It comes from that word unity. And if you read your Bible, you know that in the place of unity, God commands a blessing. Okay. That's one, two, three, four. Okay. All right. It's like a wave at a ballpark. You just catch it as it goes around. I said, I said that in the place of unity, God commands a blessing. That's why y'all not want to stay on the outs with too many people for too long. 
because you can't get nothing but chaos from that. But if your family is fractured, you ought to want to try to unify that thing because God commands a blessing at unity. If you got a bunch of drama at the job, you need to fix that as quickly as you can because God commands a blessing at the place of unity. I don't know about you, but I need God to command some blessings in some areas in my life. And he says where there's unity, I command the blessing. I like the way these folk give. Deacon Collins, but I like the way these folk give. Because your Bible says that they give, first of all, starting with their leader. Did I mention who their leader was? Brother by the name of David. I mentioned him to you. He's the one who started out as a shepherd boy. He became the sweet psalmist of Israel, singing psalms to calm folk down. He danced before the Lord with all his might because God moved him all the way to being the king of the people of Israel. He's their king. And now he leads them to give, but he shows them by example what it means to joyfully give to God. He shows them by example what it means to joyously give to God. Watch David, brothers and sisters, verses 2, 3, 4, and 5. Your Bible says that David, first of all, gave of the, his personal treasure. That, that David said, listen here, when I track my journey from where I started to where I am right now, nobody has to make me give. I'm going to joyously give to God because I recognize he did it for me in the first place. And you've got to understand, by the time we catch up with David in 1 Chronicles 29, he is balling. That's what I said. He's balling. He is wealthy. Brother man got a whole bunch of money. And now when he gets to this point, he says, wealth and honor have come from you. You did this. You made me to be as prosperous as I am right now. And so he says, I'm going to give back to God. Look at how he does it. Read verses 2 through 5. When you get a chance, you'll find out he gives abundantly to the work of building this building for the glory of God. He gives abundant resources, gold and onyx and all kinds of precious stones come out of his personal treasure because he wants God to know there is nothing too good that I have in my coffers that I cannot give to the God who's been so good to me. I guess I need to ask the question I always ask in stewardship messages. How much is too much for the one who's done so much for you? Can I, can I ask it again? I, I need to ask somebody, how much is too much? For the one who's done so much for you, if you shouting about he saved my soul, he saved my soul, made me whole, how much is that worth to you? David begins by giving of his treasure, his personal treasure, he lets everybody know he's grateful for the things that God has done for him. But wait, that's not all. Then the leaders beneath him, they say, listen, if our leader is going to do that, we've got to be just as willing to do the very same thing. And your Bible says the leaders beneath him begin to do that. Verse 6 says that the leaders of the tribes, the leaders of the family groups, they began to do that. This is analogous to our deacons and deaconesses and trustees who make sure that they likewise see the vision and join in with it. These are ministry leaders who likewise see the vision and join in with it. I can't deal with a leader who only requests and receives but never releases. You missed it. Did you guess that? I need to give it to you again. God deliver us from leaders who only request and receive, but they never release. I said at the top of this message, you and I are to be a conduit of the blessings of the Lord. I learned it when I was a child preacher, when I was a young preacher back in Chicago, Illinois. The old preachers used to say to us, hey son, you can't sit high and pay low. If you're going to be a leader, you got to be an example for folk. They need to know that you have committed yourself to doing what you have called yourself to do. I love it, brothers and sisters. The Bible says that all of these leaders are doing so. And by the end of the story, we know that everybody in the entire Israelite community is praising God and bringing their gifts because God has been so good to us. Now watch how they do it. They do so, first of all, willingly. 
You'll see it over and over again in chapter 29. They gave willingly. Nobody had to twist their arm. Nobody had to cajole them. When you understand origination, you have a willingness in participation. I said when you understand origination, you are willing to move on in participation. And so nobody has to twist their arm. Nobody has to beg them. Nobody has to burden them and plead with them. They do so willingly. But that's not all. Your Bible says they gave generously. Somebody say generously. I told you when you read verses 2 through 6, you'll see all these wonderful gifts that all these leaders have given. They've done so generously. They made sure that every need was met. Every situation was handled. They did so generously. But may I close this little part of the message when I tell you they also did so cheerfully. Yeah. Makes no sense to come to the offering time. And you looking all mad and evil and frustrated when it's time to give. If you understand origination, you know that the person who gave it to you in the first place is able to restore it in the second place. I need somebody in here who can testify. If you learn how to give, he will give it back to you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he'll give it good measure, pressed down, shaken together. And run. Can I find somebody in here who knows that he'll make your cup to run over? Is there anybody in here who can testify? He blesses you abundantly. Reverend Vasco, I've been asked on multiple occasions by some who've come by the church. They've said, why in the world? At offering time, everybody start clapping. Everybody all hitting it. They look like they're happy at offering time. I said, because we learned the principle of giving. Your Bible says in the book of Corinthians that, that, that God loves. See, y'all already know. Can't even let me preach my own sermon. Come on up here and preach it myself, yourself. He loves a cheerful giver. It literally means that you understand that there is no good thing that God will withhold from those who walk up rightly before him. Even if you get yourself in a financial fix for a little while, some kind of way God's going to work that thing out, fix that thing, and give you a testimony. I need somebody in here who understands you were broke, but you didn't look like everything you were going through. You were broke but you were still eating you were broke but you were still sleeping well anybody in here can testify every day of your life he takes care of you oh, 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 oh. that's why we give cheerfully because no matter what's going on right now we know that some kind of way Jehovah Jireh is going to step in the mix of this thing and he will provide anybody know he's a provider I said, anybody in this church know he's a provider? I ask you, does anybody in this church beside me know he will provide? My time is out. Clock on the wall says I'm done. But I got one more thing for you. I like this. The Bible helps us to understand, first of all, origination. Then we find a united congregation. All of God's people are giving willingly and generously and cheerfully because they have what I call an undying appreciation. I'm done. That's it. I'm closing my Bible. I said that they, they have an undying appreciation. If you were listening to me when I read verses 10 through 14, you heard me read a prayer of David. But it was a unique prayer, wasn't it, Reverend Barnett? This was not an ordinary prayer because in most prayers, we at least have to make some petitions to God before we say amen. But if you were listening to me, there are absolutely no petitions at all in David's prayer. David prays, prays from verse 10 to verse 13 and never asks God for anything. Even in verse 14, he never asks God for anything, he gets to verse 15 and says, we're not even worthy of this because we were foreigners and aliens. We were strangers to God. We did what you told us not to do and didn't do what you told us to do and you kept on hooking us up. Sound a little like your life? It sure sounds like mine. Somebody in here can testify, you made too many mistakes on purpose and God kept on making a way for you. He, kept on opening doors for you he kept on looking out for you I need somebody in here to testify he looked beyond 
my faults and saw my need. Oh, David doesn't ask for a thing. David just makes his prayer into a praise party. His entire prayer is praising God. If you were listening, you heard me say, we praise you, O oh God. Everything in earth and heaven is yours. We praise you because wealth and honor have been given to us by you. We praise you. We praise you. We, he keeps on praising God because God has kept on being good to him. And he prays and prays and praises in the midst of his prayer. And while he's doing that, the whole congregation is likewise leaning in to listen to the leader's praise party. He is appreciative for everything that God has done. I'm closing my little sermon, but I think I got at least 200, 300, 700, 800 people in church this afternoon who are still grateful for everything that the Lord has done in your life. I, I, I'm done. I, I, I don't want to hold you too long this afternoon. We got to get to the table. But is there anybody in here who can look back over 2019? and begin to thank God for every provision he granted in your life. I need you to look back. Don't go to 2018 and 2015 and 2010. Just think in 2019 and begin to thank God for every mountain he brought you over and for every valley he's seen you through. I need somebody to look back over 2019 and thank God that he's still the shepherd who supplies all of your needs. Somebody can testify he takes care of the needs of his own. And I don't want you to keep it general. I don't keep, I want you to keep it general. I want you to be specific. He took care of some specific stuff in your life. Where the folk he paid your mortgage and where the folk he paid your rent and where the folk he kept gas in your car. Where the folk, even if you don't have a car, he gave you bus fare to get from where you were going to where you needed to be. Is there anybody in here who can testify? He paid my light bill. He paid my car note. Somebody in here can testify. He kept me going when I felt like giving up. Anybody can be specific with the provisions that God has granted in your life. Where the folk he paid your tuition? Where the folk he paid when you didn't have, when you didn't think you had enough to pay? Where the folk who had somebody come give you something through the year and you never anticipated, never thought, saw it coming? Somebody ought to thank God for every specific need that has been met. Can I push it? Because he didn't just take care of your needs. I'm looking at somebody in here who can testify. He went beyond your needs and took, just care, took care of some of the stuff you just wanted in your life. Anybody in here know he gave you favor and gave you stuff you didn't even need? He just hooked you up. Where the people in this church who can testify? I got more clothes than I can wear in one week. I got more shoes that I can put on in one day. Somebody ought to thank God that you got an abundance of stuff. Anybody in here grateful on a Sunday afternoon that he keeps on hooking you up with stuff you don't even need? He just blesses you just because you his child. Oh, I love it. Oh, don't you love it that God just keeps on making a way out of no way? That the favor of the Lord overtakes you every day of your life. I need to find somebody in here who says, I'm grateful that he supplies my need. And I'm grateful that he gives me more than I need. But I need to find the folk in here who can also be appreciative that he gives you some stuff that money came by. I'm done. I'm done. Is there anybody in the building today? Who can go ahead and get happy with me that some of the blessings you enjoy, money could never buy that. Anybody in here thankful for peace and joy and contentment and a good night's nice rest? And when you wake up, you still got sense in your mind. Your lungs are still expanding and contracting. You can understand what I'm saying right now. Is there anybody in here who is grateful that you know better than to put your gloves on your feet and your socks on your hands? I need somebody in here who is grateful that God gives you some things money can't buy. I need the people in the room still grateful for grace, still grateful for mercy, still grateful for his loving kindness. I need some folk who are appreciative that morning by morning, new mercies we see great is thy faithfulness I'm closing the message but I need somebody in here to help me praise God for blessings that money cannot buy somebody ought to thank God for salvation somebody ought to thank God for forgiveness and forgiveness and 
forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness somebody in here ought to thank God that one Friday on a hill called Calvary that man named Jesus died in our place he took the penalty for our sin and they nailed it to the cross the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life anybody grateful you serve a giving God and a forgiving God but can I push it a bit farther the last time I checked Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain but he washed it white as snow and somebody ought to thank God that Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me that's love they hung him high they stretched him wide he hung his head for you and me he died that's love but that's not how the story ends because three days later he rose again that's love and if he can do it for me because he loves me I'll do it for him because I love him is there a witness in the building that still loves the Lord anybody in that balcony sure do love my Jesus anybody in that choir stand know he's been good to you can I find a preacher who can testify I got joy down on the inside because he keeps on doing great things for me and because of his faithfulness I'll be faithful to him I'll joyously give every time I get a chance because he's been for you hadn't he opened doors for you hadn't he provided for you then let the redeemed of the Lord say so let the men and women of God who've been saved by the blood of Jesus give God praise in the sanctuary let everything that hath breath praise the Lord and all he's done for me my soul cries out hallelujah thank God for saving me thine own have we given thee every blessing we've enjoyed has originated from the beneficent hand of a loving God and as a congregation we just ought to thank God appreciate God applaud God that all we have needed his hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. 
Don't get it twisted. There's some folk in the church today that others had counted them out. Didn't think they would survive. Didn't think they could endure. Didn't think they could persevere. But look at them in church today. Don't look like half the stuff they've been through or any of the stuff they're going through. Because God's faithfulness is great. That's why I give so joyously, so joyfully. That's why it don't have, it doesn't bother me at all to give because I recognize that as I give, God keeps giving back to me. And as I give, God keeps giving back to me. And as I give, God keeps giving back. You can't be God giving. No matter how you try. And I'm going on record today that I appreciate everything he's done everything i think i'm not the only one in this church today who is grateful for everything that the lord has done i'm done with the message maybe there's somebody in church this afternoon who says preacher i need to be in relationship with that god you've been preaching about i need to be in relationship with that jesus who will save to the uttermost I need to be in a relationship with a church that is united to glorify God. If you're here on this Sunday afternoon and you fall into either of those categories, you need a relationship with God through Jesus Christ.